Welcome everybody. I think we're ready to get started now. My name is Kaylin Washnock. I'm an outreach archivist here at the Richard B. Russell Library for Political Research and Studies. I want to thank all of you for coming out today on this really dreary day. <laughs> I wish it could be a nicer Saturday afternoon, but I'm so happy you're here with us. And I especially want to thank our speakers here. Um, another one of our speakers is going to be shuffling in here in a few moments, so we're happy to have him join us as well. But really, I want to say that none of this would be possible without the continued support of the UGA Libraries, the Russell Foundation, and the University of Georgia Press. So I'd like to thank them all for their continued support to make this event possible. Before we get started, I want to say a few words just about how all of this came about, which is back in January, Clear Film Productions came to install the Horace Mann Bond photograph exhibit that we currently have on its display down at the end of the hallway on the left. And looking at these amazing photographs, there's over 80 of them that document Rosenwall schools, the buildings, the communities, the teachers, and the students. In the early 1930s, we thought that we need to do more with this, that we really need to promote this. Um, and talking with so many people, it became apparent that not everyone knew this rich story, and we really thought that we need to um, spread awareness and education about these schools and the impact that they've had on communities and continue to to these days. So on that note, I'm going to welcome our speaker, Dr. Mary Hofschwelli. Is that right? Okay. Um, so Mary is a professor of history at Middle Tennessee State University and director of the university's quality enhancement program, MT Engage. Born in Billings, Montana, Mary grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and graduated from Chatham College. She earned her MA from the College of William and Mary and spent the first part of her career working in the museum field at Colonial Williamsburg, the Montana Historical Society, and Oakland's Historic House Museum in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Dr. Hofschwelli began research on Rosenwald schools while working on her doctoral dissertation at Vanderbilt University, which led her to her first book, Rebuilding the Rural Southern Community, Reformers, Schools, and Homes in Tennessee, 1900 to 1930. Her second book, The Rosenwald Schools of the American South, tells the history of the Rosenwald School Building Program she is the principal author of Preserving Rosenwald Schools for the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Her current research focuses on Jean schools in Alabama. She recently published an article on Jean teacher A. Wells Henderson in the Journal of Southern History. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hofschwelli. Thank you very much. And it's a real pleasure to be here with so many Rosenwald School uh, friends, supporters, and alumni. And thank you very much for having me here with you. I'd especially like to thank Kaylin Washnock and the Richard B. Russell Library Special Collections staff for having this symposium and for hosting the exhibit of these amazing photographs and then uh, bringing us all together. I'd also like to give special thanks to the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, which granted me permission to quote and show images from the Horace Mann Bond papers that they hold in their archives. And I also want to acknowledge my use of the Emory University Horace Mann and Julia Washington Bond family papers and the Fisk University Special Collections and Archives. I welcome this opportunity to take another and closer look at Horace Mann Bond, whom I've encountered multiple times in my 30 years or more uh, work on Rosenwald schools. The first time I saw his name was in tandem with the name of Clark Foreman as the investigators of a Rosenwald Fund project, the one that yielded all the photographs that you see here today in the exhibit and which was published as Environmental Factors in Elementary Negro Education. Both my work on Rosenwald School Program and in my ongoing research on, the, on Jean's teachers have meant that Horace Mann Bond's uh, name and his works come up over and over again. And for me though, one of the most interesting uh, pieces that he published uh, was his 1931 study, Two Racial Islands in Alabama, in which he took a step away from his usual work in education and history and dabbled a bit in sociology. 
He also has connections to Nashville, which is close to where I live in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Horace uh, Manbond was born in Nashville. He came back to join the faculty at Fisk University in 1928, took this field researcher position with the Julius Rosenwald Fund from 1929 to 31, resumed field study with the Rosenwald Fund in 1934, and then joined the George Peabody College Division of Field Studies in a Rosenwald-funded research post in 1937. Bond was never merely satisfied to document racial discrimination and injustice while he lived in Nashville. Sonia Ramsey, in her study of Nashville's African-American teachers, tells us that Bond was among several Fisk professors who offered to support an NAACP campaign for the equalization of teacher salaries in the mid-1930s. Now, my purpose here today is to provide some context for Horace Bond's work on school buildings, teachers, and students, the subjects uh, in the images that we see in the exhibition. And I'm also going to be talking about his work for the Julius Rosenwald Fund in the 1930s. So I'm not going to rehearse his entire biography, either his early years or the long span of his truly remarkable career in the middle decades of the 20th century. For that, I'll refer you to Wayne Urban's classic standard biography, Black Scholar. And I would also add that Vanessa Siddle Walker's analyses of uh, Georgia education includes some really great discussions of Horace Bond. The context I want to focus on begins from the vantage point of the photographs that, that are featured in the exhibition. Bond's encounters with Rosenwald schools and the Rosenwald Fund in the 1930s. We'll be looking a little bit at what uh, the photographs tell us and then at what Bond and the Rosenwald Fund tried to achieve in the 1930s to promote equality while, by exposing injustice. Every once in a while, perhaps you like me, will be a little um, ambivalent as a 21st century person about some aspects of Bond's commentary. He could be very dismissive of black educators and parents uh, and community members. He waffled a lot on the significance of school buildings like the Rosenwald schools and had complicated views of black achievement that he measured by and for an academic standard that whites had constructed. Ultimately though, I believe what we share with Horace Bond are his belief in education as a social right and his commitment to equality. Now the celebrated Rosenwald School Building Program was one of many different attempts in the early 20th century to direct the public gaze at the glaring inequities in public education in southern states. And this is actually part, just a chapter in a very long story because the history of African American education in southern states really begins long before the Rosenwald Fund or even the very first schools um, that Tuskegee constructed in the early 1910s. It dates all the way back to the later years of the Civil War and the era of emancipation and reconstruction when African Americans began advancing major claims toward universal public education. And so it's not unusual to find an earlier school here like the first Lincoln School in Pikeville, Tennessee, built by the Freedmen's Bureau in 1870, now a church, that is then replaced by a Rosenwald Fund building, the Lincoln School of 1925, and then that we are now celebrating as we preserve these schools uh, today. Rosenwald schools begin before Julius Rosenwald's involvement. They really are the brain uh, children of these three men, Booker T. Washington, Clinton Calloway, and Robert Taylor, all at Tuskegee in the early 20th century. Booker T. Washington had long been arguing that African-American children needed proper school buildings for a proper public education and calling upon teachers to undertake the task of making those buildings possible. The, he told them, these are the conditions you are working in. You can make these situations much better. Clinton Calloway was the director of the Tuskegee Division of Extension, and he worked in communities with teachers and, and community members to uh, undertake school building projects in the later uh, 
years of the decade of the 1900s and the early 1910s. And then as they did that, they realized they needed to have designs, plans to work from. And so Robert R. Taylor, the first African-American architect to graduate from MIT, uh, Tuskegee's director of industries, designed the schools. And then these were actually the first Rosenwald school plans published by Tuskegee in 1915. Of course, by that time, Rosenwald was involved beginning in 1912 when he spearheaded uh, with Booker T. Washington, the construction of six pilot sort of project schools near Tuskegee Institute in Macon County, uh, Alabama. And then from there, they would expand to a statewide and then a regional wide endeavor, trying to initially create proper environments like those that Calloway and Taylor had been building up in the past. Now, to do this, they realized they couldn't operate just out of Tuskegee or just within communities, so they collaborated with and worked through state departments of education, and in particular, the white men who were the directors of Negro education in the segregated Jim Crow system of the time. An innovation of the Rosenwald Fund was to provide matching salary support for the hiring of a state Rosenwald building agent an African-American man who would go out and do what Callaway had been doing previously, work in communities. These were often the first black men to work in state departments of education since the end of Reconstruction. And of course, teachers remain central, and the classic Rosenwald program required a match to the Rosenwald grant from community members, and so community members who were campaigning for Rosenwald schools, this is what they've been doing really since the 1860s. The program did not always operate out from Tuskegee. In 1920, Julius Rosenwald moved the Rosenwald program to a new headquarters for the Julius Rosenwald Fund in Nashville, where it was headed up by Samuel L. Smith. He was the designer of the community school plans that now have become sort of the iconic images we have of Rosenwald schools in our minds today. Here in Georgia, as you may know, uh, this, these campaigns led to the construction of 261 school buildings, 242 schools, 12 teachers' homes, and seven shop buildings, an investment of about $1.4 million with African-American, Georgians, and Julius Rosenwald contributing a little over half a million of that. Now, when Horace Mann Bond moved back to Nashville in 1928, he was already aware of the Rosenwald Fund and all of the other philanthropic foundations that were interested in and sometimes interfering in educational institutions for African Americans. As uh, the son of an Oberlin alumna, and an alumnus of Berea and Oberlin Colleges, as well as from his own career as a young scholar and an academic, he was fully aware of his role within this long tradition of African-American education. While a graduate student at the University of Chicago in the 1920s, Bond would have been studying just a short distance from Julius Rosenwald's home in Chicago, which would later become the headquarters of the Julius Rosenwald Fund. And one of Bond's first jobs was at Alabama State Normal School, now Alabama State University. There he was only 40 miles from Tuskegee, and the teachers that he trained there, many of them spent their careers teaching in Rosenwald schools. After he moved to Nashville to join the Fisk faculty, Bond would be there on the faculty for only one year before he went to work for the Julius Rosenwald Fund on the survey of black public schools in Alabama, Louisiana, and North Carolina that you see in the photographs in this building. From 1929 through the 1930s, Horace Bond would participate in the transformation of the Julius Rosenwald Fund from a philanthropy focused on public school buildings for African Americans in the South to a major foundation that pursued multiple strategies to address the roots of racialized inequality in our nation. Now, by the late 1920s, progressivism as a movement had moved beyond being a sort of little collection of reform movements 
to the administration of public agencies, and it expressed itself through professionalization and rationalization. The rise of educational psychology and other standardized testing measures tried to uh, put numbers on achievement, not just by students, but by teachers. School buildings, including the Rosenwald Fund's beloved community school plans, were now analyzed and evaluated by checklists and score sheets and indexes of efficiency. Now, the new head of the Julius Rosenwald Fund, Edwin R. Embry, fully intended to modernize the fund's operations in this way and to diversify the kinds of projects the fund would use to advance African-American causes. Under Embry's leadership, the fund's rural school program would lose ground to initiatives in higher education, scholarship and the creative arts, public libraries, hospitals, and rural and public health programs. Now, Embry had already decided that the Rosenwald School Building Program needed to move beyond small rural schools and to focus as much on instruction as construction. To get the ball rolling, he inserted a bright young white man named Clark Foreman into the staff of the Julius Rosenwald, excuse me, Julius Rosenwald Fund office in Nashville. By the way, Foreman was a University of Georgia alumnus. Now, according to Foreman, in uh, an oral history he did late in life, he said that Embry's idea, quote, really was for me to go out to Nashville and take over this Nashville office, which was then being run by a man named S.L. Smith, who had been in charge of their school construction program and was really a very nice, but sort of old fashioned guy, largely interested in school construction. When I got down to Nashville, I saw that Smith was a good guy and doing a good job, and it would be wrong for me to sort of try to push him out. So I told Embry that, and said that I didn't think I should supplant Smith, but I would stay on and do a job alongside him. He, Embry that is, agreed. And I got Horace Mann Bond as an assistant for myself. From 1929 through 1931, Bond and Foreman made a study of schools in the South. And Foreman says, we were trying to disprove the theory that Negroes were inferior intellectually by showing that if they had equal environmental opportunities that they would do equally well. Foreman recalled, well, we made this study in, I think, 11 different counties in the South. We went to a school and gave them tests, the children, tests. And then publication of the results of those tests are what earned Foreman his PhD from Teachers College at Columbia University in 1932. Now, their focus on testing meant that Bond and Foreman could document, photograph all of those schools, but conclude that the building really didn't matter by itself. What did matter was the broader social, economic, and cultural environment that surrounded the building. Now, I think we sometimes might cringe at the prospect of judging children and measuring equality by achievement test scores alone. Um, but I want to clarify, Horace Mann Bond was intensely critical of IQ tests and their misuse uh, in, terms, in terms of trying to use those to justify racial differences. He believed that comparing test results of white and black students from multiple geographic locations and school systems, comparing rural and urban schools, would disprove claims of genetic racial differences and display the impact of those larger economic, educational, and social conditions. And then, he believed, standardized testing could become a color-neutral means for equal opportunity. Now, Foreman's published dissertation interpreted all of these test scores, and before I start quoting from it, I do want to clarify, he did note throughout his dissertation and publication that he did not do this alone. He always talked about the investigators, plural. So um, Foreman reports that in Jefferson County, Alabama, now that's Birmingham, that Stanford achievement test scores for reading and arithmetic demonstrated that black children in schools operated by the Tennessee Coal and Iron Company, which invested heavily in education and health programs, that those children performed at or above grade level as third graders and were only slightly behind as sixth graders. Foreman concluded, on the whole, these results seem to warrant the assertion that the educational achievement of Negro pupils in the South is influenced by their environment 
And further, that as their environment approaches that of the white pupils, the difference between educational achievement between the two groups diminishes. So school buildings were a factor, but they were not the environmental factor. According to Foreman, they did not just photograph the schools and give tests, they also actually graded the schools, the, the buildings themselves, and they applied six standards to the schools. Um, they measured the weather tightness of the building, provisions for heat and ventilation, lighting, clean water, toilet facilities, and the presence of desks and uh, seats and a blackboard. Now, if you know anything about the details, the fine details of the Rosenwald School Building Program, those were requirements for Rosenwald School Building, so they were using those. But a school received a C rating for the lack of any one of those six standards, B if it met them all, and an A if it got, had anything more like a library. So not surprisingly, perhaps 61% of schools, 347 of the 569 schools they looked at, rated as a C building. Foreman and Bond found a correlation coefficient of 0.65 when they connected the percentage of teachers working in C-rated buildings to the percentage of third and sixth grade students that scored below grade level. While conceding that this was statistically significant and writing that, quote, if the schoolhouse is bad enough, it can almost completely stop the educational process. I think you'll see a few of those schools in the, the bomb <coughs> photographs. Uh, Foreman contended, quote, good teachers more than offset a bad building. Better education would probably result from a good teacher in a bad building than from a bad teacher in a good building. So the bottom line was that good schoolhouses are usually accompanied by good teachers, long terms, and generally favorable conditions in the community. Now, for his part, Horace Bond would later recall, quote, as I went from school to school, I was looking for buildings, for equipment, etc. But after spending three days in a rural school, you realize that it really doesn't matter whether the building is built to specifications or not. So far as equipment of one sort is concerned, it doesn't matter if there isn't a single manufactured desk in the room. Now, what do Horace Bond's photographs, though, tell us? Well, Bond's photographs show us a wide variety of school types, sizes, and importantly, conditions. So he comments on these on the back of some of his photographs. So this school is already deteriorated within 10 years of its construction. Uh, many of uh, Bond's photographs of schools, they're very similar to what you see if you look at the online database uh, on the Fisk University Library site that shows all of the photographs of Rosenwald schools collected by the fund. Like uh, those files, Bond often would contrast old buildings versus new ones, non-Rosenwald versus Rosenwald buildings. And he also gave us some tantalizing glimpses of the broader landscape. So here uh, you can see the teacher's home that stands uh, just to the left and back of this Pine Flat School in Sabine County, Sabine Parish, excuse me, Louisiana. And those were constructed just a couple years, as you can see, right before he showed up to do his testing. Importantly, though, Bond visited non-Rosenwald schools in his targeted county, so his photographs actually give us a more complete visual representation of black public education in place and time. That fuller representation also documents an enduring southern black landscape with churches, schools, and lodges as communal anchors. But of course, Bond was, at least in his writings, really focused on the students and the teachers inside those buildings. He documented their needs, the presence of illiterate people, despite everyone's best efforts in these communities, and children with disabilities. He also captured their dignity by allowing them to claim the viewer's gaze. Both his academic training and his experience in the field study with Foreman confirmed to Horace Mann Bond that school buildings were insufficient to overcome the forces of injustice. 
Now Bond reprised his and Foreman's work on the Rosenwald survey in his own book, The Education of the Negro in the American Social Order, published in 1934. And here Bond presented data on teachers, on students in schools, but not on school buildings at all. But I think um, it's interesting you can get a sense of what he's trying to show here. Um, in the chart on the right, the teachers are being classed by ABCD, their level of education, and then they're looking at the impact of different levels of teacher uh, educational attainment on the schools and their the student's real age versus their educational age. This, I think, is one of the tables that shows us what Bond was really trying to argue. Um, they're using here a standard of efficiency. That's the 100% norm for the United States. And the, everything you can imagine fed into that. Teacher education and preparation, how many years they work, teacher salaries, finance of the school system, how many students were there, and the school buildings, the school plant. So if that's the 100 standard, then um, he was able to rank all of the schools that they looked at in their different counties. And he pointed out, he's pointing out here, look at New Hanover, North Carolina, 82.9% out of that 100% in terms of school efficiency. But the students' attainment is far less. Whereas we look at Wilcox County, Alabama, where conditions were truly appalling, and remain so, I might add, until late in the 20th century, 17% um, of the national norm in terms of school efficiency, and yet those students are achieving at a much higher level. So obviously there's not a one-to-one -one correlation here. In fact, what he's trying to argue is that black school children are actually not underperforming. They are way overperforming when you put, take it into account the situations in which they're being educated. There are other clues, I think, in some of his photographs of ideas that are being planted in this survey that Bond will return to in the rest of his work. Um, for example, this image of three generations of landowners in DeSoto Parish, Louisiana. Now, in um, The Education of the Negro in the American Social Order, Bond explains that DeSoto Parish was selected because it was a, quote, moderately high altitude belt that runs through the south from the east to the southwest, and this was a great representation of that part of the south. And in a later chapter called The Social Setting, Bond describes how African Americans were losing land that they had acquired in the decades following the Civil War. If that trend continued, turning increasing numbers of landowning black farmers into sharecroppers, Bond argued, quote, the land problem would be an insuperable barrier to any permanent scheme for school improvement. And by contrast, he held up the example of Webster Parish, Louisiana, where there were still high numbers of adult illiterate people, and yet 37% of black farmers owned the land that they worked, and would, he argued, be more likely to be responsive at two efforts at school improvement. So the DeSoto farmers taking their stand in this image embodied what he thought might be lost. And he returns to this theme in the Star Creek Papers, where he emphasizes the importance of land owning, uh, particularly in the chapter 40 Acres and a Mule. Now, Horace Bond was not afraid to use his books to point out the very real limitations of what the Rosenwald Funds building program had or ever could achieve within a white supremacist state structure. He described ways that, in some cases, whites had built the Rosenwald program as examples of Southern whites' continued appropriation of resources created by and for black people. He also pointed out that uh, black schools were still losing out, in some cases uh, falling even further behind as whites embraced funding for public school systems as long as the money went to white schools. And of course, this was very much in keeping with some Rosenwald Fund officials' own sentiments. Fund President Edwin Embry always pointed out that the school building program merely kept racial disparities from being even greater than they would have been, and worried that Rosenwald grants let public school officials and white citizens off the hook. Yet, in Education of the Negro and the American Social Order, Bond also noted that 
quote, one of the great functions of the Julius Rosenwald Fund has been the creation of a more favorable public opinion, a contribution perhaps as valuable as the buildings themselves, end quote. And he thus credited the rural school building program with improving two environmental factors, the building and then public opinion. Well, in keeping with uh, the general sentiment, the Julius Rosenwald Fund terminated the school building program in 1932. Horace Mann Bond, though, became uh, one of the key black intellectuals with whom the Rosenwald Fund made common cause in its revamped agenda. And Fund President Edwin Embry took an almost paternalistic pride in Horace Bond. As a student at Berea College, Horace Bond's father, James, had known Embry's grandfather, the noted abolitionist John Fee. Bond was then, an, to become, Horace Bond that is, became a, an early recipient of a Rosenwald Fellowship for his doctoral study at the University of Chicago and became, according to Embry's biographer, one of Embry's favorite Rosenwald Fellows. And Embry constantly promoted Bond for different jobs uh, throughout uh, their relationship together, including Dean of Dillard University, President of Fort Valley State College, and of Bond's alma mater, Lincoln University. Now, Bond, of course, earned those positions on his own merits, but that his record included close supportive ties with a major philanthropic foundation was one of his many strengths. Bond's con con uh, continued connection with the Rosenwald Fund in the 1930s sheds light on changes within the fund itself. His study had pointed out that many Rosenwald schools had fallen into bad repair. And Samuel L. Smith, the director since 1920 of that school building program, knew that very well. And of course, the problem was that persistent underfunding or lack of complete non-funding of Rosenwald school maintenance. So in the late 1920s and early 1930s, Smith used an annual Rosenwald School Day competition uh, to address these problems. Smith realized that Horace Bond and Clark Foreman's study was helping the Rosenwald Fund build a case for discontinuing the school building program. So Smith tried to get in sort of before they made their final decision. He wrote to one of the fund's directors, it quote, if we can all refrain from crystallizing our thoughts on their, Bond and Foreman's, contemplated program, no doubt we can set up certain definite objectives just as the building program has influenced better school buildings, but it will be more difficult because of the intangibility and complexity of improving teacher education. Now with the Rosenwald Fund turning away from new construction, Smith organized a committee on school plant rehabilitation, which undertook a massive survey of Rosenwald school buildings. He directed a new round of demonstration projects on school maintenance, and then began to forge alliances with federal, the federal government's New Deal agencies in the Depression years of the 1930s. In fact, Horace Bond and Samuel Smith would work sort of parallel agendas throughout the 1930s, and sometimes their tracks would intersect. So when Edwin Embry convened a summit on the economic status of the Negro in Washington in 1933, he made sure that Horace Bond was there, along with other speakers such as W.E.B. Du Bois and U.S. Representative Oscar DePriest. Having staked the Rosenwald Fund's stature to a new program of what he called direct influence, Embry set to work to ensure that Roosevelt's New Deal and all of its various agencies would actually pay attention to African American needs. He realized that just like progressive reformers a couple decades before, these new federal programs would be constructed with whites in mind and then operate within state and local government structures bound by legal and customary racial discrimination. So with support from the Rockefeller Foundation, Embry, Bond, and others began to sort of bore from within the New Deal to make sure that you would get WPA schools built for African Americans on, guess what, community school plans created for the Julius Rosenwald Fund. They also followed the model with Clark Foreman and Horace Bond in their direct work with uh, federal agencies. Um, the Rosenwald Fund helped to place uh, Clark Foreman as the special assistant for Negro Affairs in the Department of Interior. 
And the whole plan uh, was, and Foreman only took the job because he was promised that he could come in as the special assistant, and then he would immediately hire black economist Robert Weaver as his assistant, and then Foreman would, after a short period, retire, and that Weaver would be allowed to move up and become that special assistant. Meanwhile, the Rosenwald Fund undertook a new rural school project, the Exploration Project, directed by James Simon and Margaret Simon in Georgia, Arkansas, and Louisiana. And they simply picked up where Bond and Foreman had left off uh, earlier in the decade. Based on Edwin Embry and Margaret Simon's surveys of schools in Dutch-controlled Java, the Simons headed up teams of explorers who lived in selected communities and worked in local schools with their teachers and community members. Their observations and experimental projects were meant to lead teacher training and curriculum development geared towards rural life. Horace and Julia Washington Bond would join the exploration, taking up residence at Star Creek in Franklinton, Washington Parish, Louisiana. Now, what's interesting is that here, Horace Bond would conclude that the Rosenwald School was more than a building. Community members expressed pride in their efforts to secure this structure and, quote, they speak of the school as our school in a sense that transcends the ordinary use of that term. Teachers have come and gone, but the memory of that united community and of their contribution centers the life of all in the institution, end quote. Now, Bond was not alone in this somewhat ironic return to the early rhetoric of the Rosenwald School Program about what a building could mean for community identity. Even Edwin Embry would reverse his course um, and give up his earlier uh, critical attitude towards school construction, claiming that every exploration school give, gives careful attention to the care and beautification of its building and grounds, and writing, it is a delight and a surprise to see how eagerly parents join with pupils and teachers in the communal task of making the school an object of pride. Now from his new position as a rural school explorer, Horace Bond became an ally again of S.L. Smith. Smith contacted Bond about submitting an entry uh, for Star Creek in one of uh, Smith's school improvement and beautification contests. And Bond wrote back praising the concept as, quote, calculated to do just what the original Rosenwald plan did, and even that in a more continuing fashion, to key communities up and bring about that deeper social advantage which is perhaps as definite a contribution as the building program itself was. So Smith then quotes that back to Edwin Embry, say, see, look, you know, your favored person. He says schools are important too. Um, and said, well, you know, Mr. Embry, uh, Horace Bond's only reservation here is that the fund's not putting up enough money uh, this time around. But Embry wasn't convinced, and, and perhaps Bond really had only been so positive to Smith in order to keep friendly ties with all levels of the fund staff. Nevertheless, Horace Bond and S.L. Smith were among the black and white educators who gathered the following spring at the office of the Federal Emergency Relief Administration to discuss what they called a satisfactory setup for giving Negroes a fair share of federal aid in the South. Well, Smith's rehabilitation program was left behind uh, with his retirement and the closure of the Rosenwald Fund's Nashville office in 1937. Meanwhile, Horace Bond's work for the Rosenwald Fund and his mutual admiration relationship with Edwin Embry bore new fruit again. Embry bought, brought Horace Bond back to Nashville, engineering a leave for him from Dillard to get an appointment at Fisk so that he could join in a comparative study of Georgia's black and white schools sponsored by Peabody College's Division of Field Studies. And that's a whole amazing story in its own right. Um, but this study also reflected Edwin Embry's fascination with combining agrarianism and progressive education into a revitalized rural curriculum and teaching force for both white and black schools. Now here, Bond was both a supporter and a critic of this renewed emphasis on rural education for much the same reason that he and Embry also worried about the embedded whiteness of New Deal programs. Um, and Ronald Goodenow, the historian, has pointed out that Bond 
um, was constantly challenging pro these progressive and rural educators of the 1930s. He says, well, if you're really serious about doing this, you have to say that you aren't just going to make sure that rural education is something that sort of correlates with or reflects rural life. You've got to take into account the reality of segregation and discrimination and not allow this, you know, the, sort of the, that to uh, rural education to perpetuate uh, that kind of situation. Thus, whatever his misgivings, though, about the revival of progressive education, Bond kept himself in the middle of the Rosenwald Fund's efforts, so he could keep making these arguments, I think. He joined uh, Embry's new Council on Rural Education in 1938, and then the next year he would take the presidency of Fort Valley State College, one of the higher education institutions that the Rosenwald Fund selected as part of a campaign for equalization. But I think really uh, Horace Bond should have the last word here. Uh, this is a section from a letter that he wrote to Edwin Embry in February of 1932. Uh, and he was writing uh, in regards to it being President's Day and telling a story about that his father told him about hearing John Fee make a, a big speech calling out George Washington for being a slaveholder and not living up to his ideals that, you know, as part of their Berea College. Uh, President's Day celebration. And uh, Horace Bond wrote to Embry uh, here, and I think his words are great. Um, the dogma of equalitarianism is subject to all sorts of impossible improbabilities, but even as a dogma, it is necessary to my frame of thought. To the determinists, I should like to say that until environmental factors have been completely equalized, I will stick, stick to the old abstraction as a working theory for programs of improvement. Equality was everything for him. Sincerely yours, Horace Bond. Thank you very much for listening to me today. All right, we have a few minutes. If anyone has any questions for Dr. Hofschwelli, I think she'd be Happy to okay. answer them here. We'll try. <laughs> yes, sir. No. Uh, will the black people pay the same as the white people? There were campaigns for equalization of salaries in the 1930s, and so you know that was something that the Rosenwald Fund was pushing in the. What he was, the Rosenwald Fund was pushing that in the 1930s, and that's part of what they were up to with um, their late 1930s project where they, had, uh, they did this big study of Georgia white and black schools. It's part of what Fort Valley is up to, is to try to raise up so there can be no claim that there, there was a reason for discrimination and different salaries. But by and large, no. And in fact, the, the, the statistics would show that black educators were often much better educated than their white peers, even as they made lower salaries, especially female. Teachers. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I just saw a snapshot that you had on, um, had fists across the front of it. it oh, yeah, yeah. The top. What was the correlation with the fists? What did it represent? Okay, so uh, the Julius Rosenwald Fund archives are held by Fisk University. And that is because of the role of Charles S. Johnson, the, the noted sociologist. He actually went to work at Fisk the same year that Horace Bond did. I think there's some interesting parallels in their careers, but uh, Johnson would become the first African-American president of Fisk, as well as the first African-American trustee of the Julius Rosenwald Fund. And because he had a very close relationship with Edwin Embry, then when the Julius Rosenwald Fund shut down, all of those records went to Fisk, where Embry had just become president. Yeah. And so, they have all of these pictures that were sent in by uh, those uh, Negro school agents and the Rosenwald building, building agents to show that the schools had been completed. They have this wonderful index card and photograph collection. And they had a grant through the with the National Trust. And I think the National I'm, I'm Historic Records, that, that thing. Yes. <laughs> yes. The archivists and special collections people know what I'm talking about. Um, but they got a grant to digitize that collection. So you can go online and search by county, 
um, state, school type, name. It's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they have the Star Creek School in there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sir? Did you show a, a photo of the Hart County Training School on one of those displays? No, the but they, displays. we could look that up, though. Yeah. Yeah, because there is one. Yeah. Right, right. And I don't know how many, uh, the photographs in that database, they aren't complete. Some of those pictures were lost over the years, but the index cards are there. And um, they actually have now the papers of S.L. Smith. He took a lot of stuff home with him when he left and retired because he was going to write a book. But all of that has now been returned. So there's even more information. And they have some great photographs of schools um, that aren't represented in that online database, but schools where they were then subsidizing transportation, bus service, mm -hmm. just an ama amazing second yeah. round of photos. Yeah. We had one photo uh, that I didn't get a good look at. Okay. It was a white building, just a corner of it. Um, it was, again, a corner of a white wooden structure, and there was some students standing by that structure, so I'm just wondering. What school was that? It was a white wooden school. Yeah. Of just a portion of the far end of it. And there were some students uh, standing by the picking up right there in that location. So. That's Edgecombe, yeah. I don't know which school it is, but it's Edgecombe County, North oh, Carolina. It's yeah. County, North Carolina. Yeah. And I'll jump in. That photograph is actually in the exhibit as well. Right. Um, Horace Mann Vaughn had kept the glass negative, so you can see that photograph yeah. in the exhibit. Yeah, down the hall. yeah. this is one of the most yeah. poignant, yeah. I think. I, I love the, the pictures that have children and then teachers. You know, you have so many of them here mm -hmm. that show his interest in teachers and students. Yes, there was a, Not just there the was building. a picture of the Hart County Training School in the wood structure before Mm -hmm. that had a corner of the building just like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what kind of reminded me of. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. that picture is, I think, in this records as well. So. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They raised them up so they'd be ventilated underneath, keep them yeah, a little bit was, cooler. Was raised, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I went to that school. Oh, school like that. Okay. Yeah. Right kind of training. Okay. Which was a very... Uh, is there a dollar total for the Roosevelt Fund? Uh, I don't know if you said it. Um, the, the total fund? Mm -hmm. Oh, the total? Yeah, way back. Oh, you, the school building, we can show the school buildings. I can pull out something that will have the, I've got a book with me there. So, Roosevelt Schools is right, it's, um, it's 28.4 million. But the Rosenwald Funds part of that, you can see, is 4.3. African American citizens, 4.7. Whites, 1.2. And then tax revenues. And that was the whole point, to make public school systems pay for the schools that they should have been running. The, whole, right. the point wasn't for everybody to give and donate. It was to get that public investment that was being denied. Now, if you, were at, but you were asking about the total Rosenwald Fund. Because that's I I know about it. It's, it's a lot more. Because they he uh, Rose, Julius Rosenwald funded that largely with Sears stock, which until 1932 meant that they were constantly accruing money. Then suddenly they were scrambling. So when they yeah. shut down, it was. They didn't shut down until 48, but that was because Julius Rosenwald didn't believe in foundations lasting. He told them to spend their money, and it became a lot easier for them to spend all their money after the depression. Yeah, yeah. it would have been harder up. There's a funny story where Foreman says, well, they were trying to spend all their money, and we had to think of stuff to spend it on. And then the Depression happened, and suddenly it wasn't such an issue anymore. Yeah. So. How late were, what was the latest uh, of any Rosenwald school that was still in use for our teachers? In use? There's some in use today as so schools. That are actual working Actually, we're <laughs> working schools. Yes. Yes, sir. Not very many, you know, because they have to be really upgraded to meet our standards now for that you would have to meet to operate a school building with children in it. Um, but yes, there are schools in operation to this day. As a school. As a school, yeah. right. What, what accounts for the 
supply and discrepancy in the number of schools built in the state. And state. Um, was there a, was some states less receptive to program existing? I mean, Georgia's relatively low on that. Uh, if you look at the map or that tally, um, 787 schools in North Carolina and only 242 in, North, in Georgia. Okay, so what would Hor Horace Bond would say? Yeah, but remember my chart? North Carolina maybe put a lot of money into some aspects, but they clearly weren't getting res results mm -hmm. elsewhere. Yeah. Something was still wrong. Uh, but yeah, there's a, it's a real, it's complicated. But some of it does have to do with public opinion and just, uh, and then having the right combination of people in the right places. Um, if you, Alabama, if you looked at it, it's where the Rosenwald program began. But the number of schools built after 1920 plummets. So you know, there's a lot of stuff that's hidden underneath those general figures. And I don't think there's, there's no one um, answer, but it's, it depends on where you, you look. It really is a very much a local situation when you, when you get down to it. Yes, ma'am, would you say uh, that we're still facing some of the same problems in the schools today that they were facing then? I, absolutely. Um, I think we see it in the resegregation of public education. Um, I think we see it in um, the, just inequalities in funding. Um, and then you know, people just walking away from public education. So uh, yeah, I think we're, we still, we, this is persists. I don't know that it never went away and it, it persists. And in some ways, yeah, I think we, we see some resurgence of some of these issues as well. With uh, integration, uh, a lot of the minority schools in Georgia, especially, were de-emphasized. And matter of fact, it was almost as if they never existed, never seen them in intent, because a lot of the markings were removed from the school and, and discarded and thrown away as if the school never existed. Mm -hmm. so, And I think that's that is so interesting. Some places have they, you know, they took that that original name off, or if it did use the Rosenwald name as part of the school name, they made, that went away. Some places have put it back. Some places have always had it. Um, alumni have built memorials, monuments to their schools, put them up outside the buildings to remind people. Um, but yeah, it, and I think this is the studies uh, of this also just document that it's always the, the black school that pays the price of, in, of integration. And the black teachers, principals, as well as students pay the price. And one of the problems though with having a school designated as historical is the owners sometimes don't want to uh, do that because it means that they can't, they will have difficulty in changing it. You know, Right. Designated as a so it's kind of about the difficulties when a building is declared historic. Yeah. Although I, my, I would have to defer to my colleagues in historic preservation um, who, who could deal with that in terms of much better than I could. Um, you know, usually it doesn't stop you from doing what you want unless you want to use federal money, right? And that, but, but, but I think um, just there, just to get on the national register, for example, means you have to. But within certain guidelines, and I think yeah, we have owners of school buildings here. Um, it, it's it's tough, and I, I but I've seen all sorts of things. People who turn them into homes, nursing homes, apartment buildings, um, head starts, um, they, kindergartens, daycares, community buildings. They've been reclaimed by churches as well. Yeah. But it's owned by, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'd just like to address the, the question of uh, National Register nomination and what it means. Um, I'm actually now the chair of the National Register Review Board for Georgia. Um, and we met yesterday. 
Uh, and one of the applications that we saw yesterday was for a school called Cherry Grove School, it's a church built school with books kind of thing. Um, and they, I think there's a general misunderstanding of what the National Register means and what, what protections it offers or doesn't offer. Um, and the important thing to know is the National Register status bestows no protection on the building of any kind. It doesn't, it, it doesn't disallow you from doing anything to that building. What it does do is it makes that building eligible federal grants and, and uh, tax credits potentially for rehabilitation. So there's, 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 in my mind, there's only a net benefit to national register status. Um, what the, the regulation aspect of preservation comes from, from local designation, um, which is a different process altogether, and that's covered by state statute. But the, the, um, uh, in the case of, uh, say, Fairview School that Joyce is going to talk about, or Cherry Grove, which we saw yesterday, um, it's a hard slog sometimes to get the, get the information together to, to do these nominations, but in the end, the uh, benefits far, far outweigh any, any negatives to it. So um, just be, I mean, just want to be clear that National Register status doesn't prevent any rehabilitation action from, ha from happening, and it also doesn't prevent demolition from happening. It doesn't prevent yeah. further exactly, yeah. decay or, or diminishment of, of, a, of, a, of a resource at all. Um, but if there are some real benefits. One more thing, I'll just say that, you know, you know that I've, uh, with our school, uh, the Eleanor Roosevelt um, School in Warm Springs has been in my family for 30 years. And so uh, we got on the historic in 2010. And uh, it's hard to get the community if there's not any funding available or to get them on board yeah. to do anything. My father operated a business out of there for 10 years or so, but then you know, they tried to keep it restored, and, but then there's a lot of, you know, we had to block the windows up and things like that to keep it somewhat together. But uh, it, it's been difficult to, uh, to do anything past what we were trying to keep the building up. It had the little cafeteria, still has it. So I guess it may have been one of the last rows of them. It was the last. I think it was the yeah, last. <laughs> yes. And so I don't, some of you may know about it, but uh, you know, it, it's FDR wanted it a school named after his wife. So it's kind of got its name. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you, everybody. Um, I think we're going to take a Five minute break. All right, everybody. So our next speaker is Joyce Purdue Smith. She is a native Georgian. She is the daughter of Catherine and the late Eugene Purdue Sr. Joyce grew up in Cave Spring, Georgia, a small one red light town in a close, commi close knit community in Northwest Georgia. She graduated valedictorian of her senior class in Cave Spring High School and pursued an undergraduate degree in America's Heartland. After attending and graduating with a BA in Business Administration in Columbia, Missouri, Joyce subsequently completed an executive MBA program at Mercer University in Atlanta. Soon after her graduation from Stevens College, Joyce was recruited to the management training program at the United States Steel Corporation in Gary, Indiana. Since that time, she's held managerial positions at Fortune 500 companies such as General Electric, General Electric and accounting positions for the state of Georgia. Joyce also followed her parents' footsteps as an educator at Shorter College teaching accounting and international business. Joyce returned to Rome, the Rome area in 2009 and began researching her parents' professional careers. In doing so, she discovered that her father's first principalship began in Cave Springs, Georgia at the Fairview School. She later discovered that this was a Rosenwall School. She has since served as the executive director of the nonprofit whose mission it is to restore this historic campus to again serve the children of our great state. In this regard, Governor Deal acknowledged her significant achievements and in 2015 awarded her a Governor's Art and Humanities Award. Joyce is quite active in the community, having served on the boards of the Rome Convention and Visitor Center, Cave Spring Historical Society, the Alton Holman Heritage Art Corporation, and the Rome Area Heritage Foundation. 
She has two children who are her pride, and she has one grandson, Jarek Jr. Please join me in welcoming Joyce Purdue-Smith. honor it is for me to be at the University of Georgia giving a presentation on uh, the Rosenwald School. The little Rosenwald campus in Cape Spring is really the heart, my heart now. Um, as mentioned in my bio, um, I had uh, about 10 years ago, I uh, had gotten caught up in the recession that was about to fall and uh, decided to go back to the Rome area. And in so doing, I started to research my dad's professional career uh, and it kind of began with a lot of things that my parents, uh, had, my parents and his family had told me along the years. I'd heard all about the typical story that was typical of most African American children during that period of time. Um, his mom, my grandmother, was a cook in one of the uh, homes in, in the Rome area. My dad was very poor. Uh, he, he used to tell me about how most times he wouldn't walk to school at the same time that the other kids did, or if he did, he would take another route so that they couldn't see exactly how um, uh, poor he was. He told me about how when um, he would get home from school, his one goal was to get an education. And so when he came home from school, he had an old car, uh, card table that he would put out on the front porch. And while everybody else was playing uh, basketball, football, baseball, or whatever, he was at home on the porch uh, with his books, getting his lessons, as he called it. Additionally, he took great pride uh, in knowing everything that there was to know about his educational experience within the grade that he was in. He was especially excited when uh, the people from the school board would show up, and one of his teachers would allow him to get up to the board and do a mathematics problem. It just tickled him pink that he was able to represent the school. So as I said, about 10 years ago, I was really thinking about retiring and trying to count my money and my banking account and all that other sort of stuff. And I went back to Rome, Georgia. Became all enthralled in his career. I did extensive research over the Florida County Board of Education and didn't really know all about what I was reading. I mean, I saw things about Rosenwald and I saw things about you know, the African-American experience and I saw something about you know, the different teachers and people who were involved, but really just didn't put two and two together at that point in time. And then one day, um, my mom told me that she thought the school was still there. So uh, a group of alumni took me uh, to a mountain. And in Cape Spring, there's a little area uh, called Patlock. And that little area was the African-American community uh, for a very long time, and to a certain extent still is now. But during that period of time uh, that I was there, some of the alumni told me, come on, Joyce, that school where your dad taught is still here. And I thought, oh, OK. After 60 years, it's still here. OK, tell me about that. So uh, the area is mountainous, and so uh, some of them took me over to an opposite mountain uh, so that I could look out into the fields. Now, mind you, uh, I think you all know about kudzu, the plant that ate the south. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was a sea of kudzu out there. There was nothing to be seen other than the different levels. You could very well tell where the terraced areas began and end, ended. And so as a part of that, they kept pointing, they kept saying, Joyce, don't you see the school? And I thought, I do not see a school anywhere. And that's just continued to point. And then, after so long, I saw a little twinkling of the tin roof. And they told me, Joyce, do you see it? And I said, I see it, I see it. So they ran led to uh, some other things that happened. Um, they uh, went down to the campus, kind of cut a little path for me to go up to the school, and we saw it. I came back. I mean, I was all in tears. I got my dad's DNA. So I was so happy about that. And as things would happen, I would call it karma, or some of you may call it you know, some, something else, uh, I connected with a lady by the name of Jeannie Syria. And we were talking. Jeannie's in the audience, by the way. <laughs> we were talking and that sort of thing, and Jeannie said, um, you know, I know about Cave Spring, and I was looking for a school by the name of E.S. Brown. And I thought, E.S. Brown? I attended E.S. Brown. And so we began to talk more, and it turned out that she was looking for this Rosenwald school called Fairview. And I thought, Fairview? I read about that in the board books up in Florida County Board of Education. And therein blossomed the story that the little campus where my dad had taught, for 50-some teachers had taught, what six principals had taught, was a Rosenwald campus and that it was a national treasure. Well, I can tell you, everybody in Cave Spring scrambled up to Fairview. OK, and let me say this before I forget. If any of you are UGA fans, and if you are especially a fan of, fan of Nick Chubb, we claim Nick Chubb in Cave Spring. 
<laughs> so I'm going to tell you this. As I started to think about kind of what to prepare, and I kind of assumed that most of you knew most of the story about the Rosenwald story, I thought I would make it specific to the Fairview story, the Fairview School. And so we've started an initiative about 10 years ago, and it's called the Fairview School Restoration Project. And what we claim we are doing is rebuilding history. So since they say pictures are worth a thousand words, you'll see a lot of pictures in this uh, presentation. This is how we found the school. That's why I couldn't see the little tin roof. It took me so long to see it. But it was all covered in kudzu. You wouldn't believe it. But I understand it was the kudzu that saved it. After some deliberation, some of the alumni decided that their school needed to be saved. And so they started an endeavor to do so. And on that very first, uh, very first day, many of them gathered with me. And we circled together, hands holding, uh, holding each other's hands because we were definitely afraid that that big black bear that so many people had told us about, Mama Sue, was somewhere hiding within the, hiding within the kudzu. And there they are, beginning the first removal of the kudzu. There were about 10 of them. You don't see them reflected in this picture. And it took several different uh, times and dates and that sort of thing to remove the kudzu from the, from, the, uh, from the campus and off the building. So today what I'd like to talk briefly about, and I'll be followed by my most gracious and the most wonderful architect in all of Georgia, well, I should say all of the US, <laughs> Joe Smith, uh, who has been with us uh, since 2011, where I met him at the Georgia Trust. Uh, February was receiving uh, an award and being named a place in peril in 2011. I was standing in a corner all by myself. Joe walked up to me, befriended me, and he's been with me since then. I don't know if that's charisma or whatever the case may be. But what I'd like to talk to you about just for a few minutes, and then he's going to follow with some of the actual restoration story and tactics of uh, restoring the building, will be just a few things. Number one, it will be about our business plan, uh, our vision, mission, and goals, which are very lofty and very expensive. Uh, I'll talk about some of our objectives, give you a short historical account, and you may go to our website to get a more extensive uh, account of the school. I'll talk about some of our accomplishments and then our future plans. So our executive summary reads about like most executive sum summaries. Uh, we say that Fairview seeks to give back to Northwest Georgia through the awareness, documentation, and preservation of the values of the early 20th century educational experiences, cultural values of namely the Fairview School. We have a huge vision, <laughs> a huge vision, one 10 years in the making. We want to create a living campus, which will be the first of its kind in Northwest Georgia, interpreting the cultural and the educational experiences of African Americans. It will differentiate itself as a new heritage tourism attraction, honoring the governor's initiative to boost tourism revenues and support the Georgia performance standards on education. Next, we plan to preserve what is left, the first grade building. And let me make that distinction now. Um, our actual Rosenwald School is no longer in existence. Uh, over time, that building was demolished by uh, the previous owners. But what does stand is our first grade school building. And I find it so amazing that it's the first grade school building that must still be standing. The place where people first learn to read. The place where people first learn their ABCs. And I think that's a common denomination, denominator amongst all of us who've matriculated in any educational system across the, across the United States. I just find it amazing that it's the first grade school building. We have a four acre campus and we tend to model it after the Tully Smith Farm in Atlanta. From the viewpoint of completing the features so that they are historically correct, uh, we plan to include gardens and to have docents reenacting alumni remembrances of their days at Fairview. And then lastly, I told you it was a big vision, we plan to provide educational programs for all children, particularly in grades one through six, offering field trips and camps which model the curriculum of the John C. Campbell Folk School for the Arts, 
and the STEM program, science, technology, engineering, we left the A out, arts and math programs, which are very uh, popular now in the school systems. So why is Fairview so important? And I won't go through all of the points that I have listed here, but I think there's two main reasons that I think the Fairview is so extremely important. Um, one of the things that we have done over the course of, of our trek to restoration is that we have uh, really used a lot of the guidelines offered by the National Trust. And the National Trust indicates that if we don't preserve history, then history is all lost. And it's places like Fairview where our footprint and our identity is really on the timeline of eternity. And if we don't do something to save that history, then all is lost and that period of time is totally uh, not reflective of all that happened during that period of time. And then lastly, future generations need to know what happened. I mean, my grandson is three. He will never, ever know. He will never, ever know about a point in time when kids love to say, uh, love to say, uh, the Nash, sing the national anthem. They took off their hats. They stood proud. He will never know about a time when kids didn't have an opportunity uh, to get an education. He will never know those things. And so for those two basic reasons, I think February is an important place and it has shared, and it has a place on the timeline of history. So the historical account. Our actual Rosenwald School was called the Cave Spring Color School. Um, this school was built in 1924, and it was preceded by a building that we found on um, a Sanborn map. It was a 1905 Sanborn map. Someone found it for us. And I tell you, every time we find a little piece of information, we all just kind of share it <laughs> and kind of cry sometimes when we find some of these things. But we found the little first little evidence of, uh, of uh, an educational experience in Cave Spring it was the Little Cave Spring Color School, and it was on the 1905 Sanborn map. The Floyd County Board uh, of Education had tons of information about the Cave Spring Rosenwald School, how it all came together, and it was traditionally, it traditionally came together as all of the um, other properties uh, that Rosenwald funded did. Um, our Rosenwald School uh, funded, uh, that we funded was a three-teacher building. It was constructed to the Tuskegee Plan in Cave Spring, Georgia, 1924. And later on, traditionally, Rosenwald schools would turn, would be renamed to a school that is more endearing and more indicative of the situation in which the school resides. Our school sat on a terraced uh, property, four acres. It sat high atop of the hill, and you could see all over Cave Spring, all over Vans Valley from that particular point. And the kids thought, oh, we had a real vantage point of being, a, being able to see far and wide of what was occurring in our city and gave us more inspiration to try to receive an education. The first principal was Mr. J.B. Atwater. He was there between 1925 and 1928. He was born down in Flippin, Georgia and was one of nine children to John and Molly Atwater. He studied at Morris Brown College and became a public school professor, principal of the Fairview School, and minister of the AME Church in Cave Spring, Georgia. And that was kind of atypical in that period of time uh, was for the principal to also be the, be the minister at some church. And uh, his brother, Anna T., founded the first black newspaper in Rome, Georgia, just 16 miles away from Rome, Georgia. So it's, I'm sorry, it's life experiences, I'm sorry, we have captured most of the biographies of all of the 50-some teachers that taught there. It was an arduous process. You know, funeral homes were able to provide some things, but then if a funeral home was bought, you lost the information, or if there was a fire someplace, you just would just sort of lost the information. So every time we would find some teacher in their bio, we would just almost, like I say, come to tears. Uh, there's one professor uh, in particular uh, that we were most enamored by, um, and these people that came to Cave Spring, I mean, came from various resources. Uh, and his name was E.S. Brown, Edward Simeon Brown. He had matriculated or lived uh, most of his life in, um, in Tennessee. And somehow this man made it all the way to Harvard University in 1905. And then somehow again, after receiving a most prestigious, uh, you know, educational experience there, he wound up in Cave Spring, Georgia. I don't understand how that happened, but we're <laughs> awfully glad that he did.
The alumni always tell me about pride, dignity, and respect, and they base it on the school's motto, which simply read, good, better, best, I will not let it rest until my good is better and my better is best. And I think that kind of capsulizes all of what they embraced as being good and true during that period of time. This is the entire school, circa 1940, 1945. Uh, someone mentioned, we mentioned the Jean supervisors. Uh, the lady clear here to the left by the man here, uh, to the left, uh, that's E.S. Brown to the right there. The lady uh, next to him is Musha Kendrick White. She was the Jean supervisor at the Fairview School during that period of time. And all the way to the right, the last lady standing out to the side, the long, tall, thin uh, lady on the, on the end there, that's Nick Chubb's great-grandmother. <laughs> well, Fairview actually was, over a period of time, the consolidation of several different community schools. And during the Depression and that sort of thing, uh, it just became impossible for the school systems to maintain all the local schools. And so five of the, I'm sorry, yes, five of the local schools were closed, and the children were then, um, I always want to say bust, the kids walked to Fairview. And some of you should hear some of the stories they tell about the walk to school and the things, the things that happen. This is a picture of the first grade class of 1949, and I will admit that we have very few pictures, but this one in particular is one that we cherish so much because most of the kids in that building uh, are still alive. Um, you can barely see her, but there's a little girl standing in the window, I guess where the sun is coming in, and you can't very well see her or what she's doing, but she's actually holding up a card, and she's alive to tell us that today. She's holding up the spelling word for the day, and she couldn't remember what that word was. Mm -hmm. But our aunt came from a large family, which was typical of that period of time. There were 16 of them. And um, she loves to tell the story that uh, whenever she and her, uh, whenever her father took them places, that he would line them all out and count them one by one to be sure he had all 16. <laughs> and if I didn't say so earlier, it's the first grade building that's still, I did say that, that, this, that is still standing. And this is the school that we're trying to restore. This is the PTA, circa 1945. Uh, the PTA played a very important role uh, in financing uh, various aspects of the campus at that point in time. There was lunch for the deprived children. I understand there were flowers that had to be planted. There was the maintenance of the grounds to be taken care of. And then there were the treats at Christmas. The treats at Christmas, which everybody just so, were so happy to receive, was a bag, a brown bag, with oranges, apples, and some nuts. That was a real treat to them at that point in time. And as I said earlier, Nick Chubb, running back for UGA, is the great-grandson of the PTA president, Retha and Sonny Chubb. And if you see the little stars, there's Miss Retha right in the middle, smiling graciously, in the back, the granddad. So the road to restoration, it has been a long one, and we have done an enormous marketing and PR uh, plan. We have launched one that has really just about driven us all into the ground. But it was all for the good because we have finally finished our building. So some of the things that we did along the way, which um, I think helped us uh, to continue to garner support around the state, was that uh, we were listed to the Places in Peril by the Georgia Trust in 2011. After many fish fries, barbecues, and chitlin sellings, we purchased the 3.8 acre Fairview campus in 2012. The next year, in 2013, we developed our strategic plan, primarily a marketing plan of how we would move around our local area and around the state to garner support. And that entailed becoming involved with a lot of the store, a lot of the organizations that were involved with historic preservation, the historical societies, and that sort of thing. We received the Humanities and Arts Award from uh, Governor Deal in 2015. We hosted our second gala, the biggest ticket in town, in 2016, and it was at that gala that, well, actually, Mary has attended both of our galas. We had a 2014, but a 2016. Uh, Aviva Kempner, uh, the filmmaker of uh, the Rosenwald film, allowed us to uh, pre uh, allowed us to show uh, the 
the Rosenwald Film in Northwest Georgia. We were very proud of that. It was shown at the oldest theater uh, in this area, and we were very proud of that. In 2016, uh, our architect completed our preservation plan, along with our archaeologists completing the, the excavation. In 2017, we were listed to the uh, National Register of Historic Places. Um, during that period of time, we developed a statewide presence uh, and became involved in the Heritage Trail that's being um, planned for Northwest Georgia. And we became uh, National Trust. Uh, we we uh, participated in, act in activities with the National Trust. And then lastly, the event the actions that changed our destination, that made it possible, actually, that I should say, occurred in 2018 when we were able to restore our school. And that was all due to the generosity of the most generous philanthropists in Northwest Georgia. We had been pursuing him for years. Um, one year, we fed him cakes. <coughs> Um, he came to an event that we were um, hosting. He enjoyed the cakes. And so right before Christmas, he was living in New York. We were here in Rome. We FedExed him a cake. He sent $5,000. <laughs> <laughs> in 2013, uh, I fed him the song, Saga Story, of, oh, we haven't finished the project yet, and we need to do something. And he allowed us to use his uh, Southern Living listed home to raise $10,000. And then lastly, in 2017, he called me up and said, okay, Joyce, I'm throwing in the towel. I'm gonna to help you guys. Well, we were just ecstatic. Um, he held a, um, a barbecue at his home, a luncheon. People from all over, you know, when, when Wes speaks, everybody shows up, including myself. If I'm driving, I break the law, I answer the phone. Um, but um, he held an event at his home and he pretty much told the community um, that he wanted to see Fairview uh, succeed. He talked about the fact that he had helped so many people in that room and that they were the movers and shakers of the, of the community and that it would be a shame if Fairview would fail. The checks started to come in. We raised $120,000 and with his $75,000 donation and a grant, we had the $220,000 balance needed to restore our school. We were very pleased with that. Then lastly, uh, down at, uh, at the Cape Spring Welcome Center, this is just to show of pictures, we have uh, a recreation of the first grade uh, building, and that's just for visitors to see when they come into town. We've already held one uh, children's event on the campus. That's the George Washington Carver Experiment, and that was uh, uh, sponsored by uh, one of our partners, Alton Home and Heritage Arts uh, uh, Incorporated. Children were given the opportunity to plant uh, uh, peanut seedlings and hear the story of, uh, of, ES, of uh, George Washington Carver. We have a cookbook, uh, and there are a few still left on the table out front if you'd like to uh, purchase one. Uh, some of the ladies uh, included some of their favorite recipes from around, uh, the, the, uh, around the city, and we hosted a cooking show. Now, mind you, let me tell you, there were two parts to that cooking show, which, not, which is not seen here. There were the traditional t uh, dishes, and then there was a table that had the heritage dishes on them. And so the heritage dishes included some items that really I've never tasted myself. But as they began to uncover the shaping dishes, some of the ladies ran. Uh, <laughs> for it included pig feet, pig ears, chitlins, and the whole bit. But it was a successful show. Our equalization school was named E.S. Brown. Um, and over the course of time after it closed, it became a park and it became named after someone else and it changed things a few different times. Our community has been great uh, in supporting us. We uh, approached our local community and park board service and they renamed our equalization school back to its original name after the principal E.S. Brown. So we were very uh, pleased with that. Um, traditional to most African-American settings, you know, you have people that love to sing. Um, during the time of February, there was a club called the, the Glee Club. And those guys uh, really um, competed uh, around in the area. And they made an appearance, appearance at our 2016 gala. 
and they turned the place out. Uh, in 2014, um, one of the playwrights in Atlanta, playwrights in the area, wrote a play. It was called "A Place of Pride and Dignity," and it was about all about the values and the day in the life of Fairview. And those are two of the uh, uh, stars uh, from that uh, particular uh, showing. It was a sellout crowd, as I might say. 2016, I mentioned the biggest ticket in town. Uh, we like to brag that at that event, uh, to the left here, we had uh, Nettie uh, Douglas. Nettie is the great-granddaughter of both Booker T. Washington and uh, Frederick Douglas. She resides in Atlanta, and one of our advisors tracked her down and got her to come to the, uh, come to the attend the gala. On the other side is her husband, I mean, sorry, it's her son, uh, Kenneth Morris. Uh, Kenneth is doing an extensive study on Frederick Douglas, and uh, he was able to attend. He's a marvelous speaker. And in between there are Julius Rosenwald's uh, closest uh, relatives, his grandson, Peter Askeley, and his wife. We were so happy to have them attend our gala in Rome, Georgia. This is another class that was offered by the Alton Holman Heritage Arts uh, Incorporated. Even though we have no building just yet ready to use, they've moved forward with forming an alliance with Cape Spring Elementary to present certain classes. And this is the Stepping Stone class where they paired with an alumni to uh, make stepping stones that will eventually be on the campus. And there's the almost $2 million Southern Living Home that helped to raise that $227,000 that we needed. This is our grain, groundbreaking ceremony. After the funds were raised, over 100 people attended uh, our groundbreaking ceremony, and it was a rushed event, a rushed event. Uh, Savannah Construction and Preservation is, uh, was our uh, contractor on site, and they finished the building uh, properly, completed, and we're just so thankful for that. Uh, there's a long line. I think there were about 40 shovels there. It was very hard to narrow that down to two because so many people had helped us in this event, in this endeavor. Future plans. Uh, just real quickly, and then Joe will give the uh, balance of the presentation. Uh, we're looking to complete the external uh, features to our building. Uh, we need to work on our site preparation, preparation, which would be including places to park, uh, paving the roads, and the landscaping plan. And we think that the landscaping opportunities are unimaginable because we sit on the side of a side of a hill, and it would be a beautiful, uh, beautiful site. And then our master plan. There again, there's the discovery in 2009. Underneath the tarp, after the cut sewer was removed, that top picture reflects what the building looked like um, after the, the cut sewer was moved. The bottom picture reflects the many tarps that we used to keep it safe and secure during the eight years that we were trying to raise the necessary funding. This is the completed building. Isn't it gorgeous? <laughs> If you could be there on any morning, and Joe would have to maybe attest to this more than I can, because he's probably been there so as well. It really brings tears to your eyes when you walk up to the campus and you see from whence we've come, and you can see the, the trees in the background. If it's morning, if it's the mist, and the whole the whole nine yards. It's just, it's just a beautiful sight and so much potential leading up to the lofty, expensive goals that we have set. <coughs> this is the re-envisioned campus of what we envision that first area of the property um, to look like. Uh, you'll notice the Rosenwald, I'm sorry, our first grade school building in the back. Uh, there in the front, the only remaining feature of our Rosenwald school is the chimney that you see that will anchor um, the one side of the, the plot. Since it was a three teacher classroom, a three teacher uh, building, there were three classrooms and those are depicted by the three little gardens. The staging area, um, there was a small, um, small auditorium uh, inside of our building that they used for plays and that sort of thing. See the three little uh, uh, seats there for, um, for that. And then that last part is a um, storage area for tools and that sort of thing. So that's my portion of the presentation. Uh, now I'll ask Joe to come forward and tell you more in detail about the restoration.
<laughs> How do I get back to the desktop? <laughs> Is there some good? I see it. Better. Okay. Good enough. Uh, this presentation was delivered to two uh, middle schoolers three days ago uh, at the Hillsman Middle School here in Athens. So ignore this slide. Um, uh, my name is Joe Smith. I'm an architect. Um, I live in Madison, but I have a practice here in Athens, um, Architectural Collaborative here in Athens. Um, but I've been working with Joyce <laughs> since 2011, like she said, uh, when I met her at the, at the unveiling of the Places in Peril for the Georgia Trust. Um, and the, the thing that was compelling to me as an architect, as a preservation architect, about Fairview was that it was so in such poor condition. And it's not alone in being in poor condition. There's many, many, many buildings in Georgia, especially African-American associated um, resources in Georgia that are in pretty rotten shape. And for the most part, people look at a building like that and they'll write it off and they'll say it's too far gone. Um, we can't really do anything. It's not worth putting the money into it. Uh, and it's basically left to rot um, to its eventual um, complete elimination from the historical record, except for archeology. span um, but I wanted to, uh, the story of Fairview is incredibly compelling and what's um, also important is to show that buildings like this can be restored. Um, it does take time and it does take money, but they're not, there's no such thing as a building that's too far gone in my book. Um, so I, I just wanted to illustrate a, a bit for you folks, um, even though there were sort of, I call them heroic efforts to put this building back together again, that it is possible. Um, so there is 2011. Uh, one of the, if you watch the cursor, the roof had, had opened up here at this end of the building and it, it essentially detached the end wall from the side wall of the building, um, causing the side wall to come swinging out um, off of its foundation. Uh, and that led to the loss of some of these windows. You can see that the paint, which was, this building was painted white back in the day, but you can see that there's not really any paint left. So no maintenance from there. When this building was used on a regular basis until 1954. Um, when then it was closed and all of the kids were, were moved to the equalization school that was built in Cave Spring, the E.S. Brown school that Joyce mentioned. And um, uh, the school was closed down and it was just kind of left there, left there on the hillside for the kudzu to grow up over and, and to be forgotten about. Um, interestingly, in 20, the process of getting the National Register listing for this property started with a listing just for the building alone. And some of the prejudices that you come across in the, in the nomination process were evident in this, in the process that we went through here because, because the National Register folks said that this building didn't have enough in historic integrity to be nominated as an individual building. And so ultimately it took a sort of an end, an end run around that attitude to incorporate the entire campus as a site which included archaeology as one of the criteria for its listing on the National Register. Because of the loss of the Rosenwald Building, that is what we have. We have, we have archaeology. Um, that was how it was done, and that's how it, was, how it is listed now. Which is interesting because ultimately it means that any, of the, any alterations to that, to that historic site, not just the building but the whole historic site, um, that use federal dollars um, do have to be reviewed by the state historic preservation um, folks. Um, and that means that there's sort of a, a, a minimum threshold for competence, I think, when it comes to how you put a building like this back together. Um, you, can tear it, you can tear it down and rebuild it, and some people would call that a historic building, but, but that's not a historic building. That's a recreation of something that was lost. Um, so in this case, because we were using grant money from, um, from the Historic Preservation Fund, all of the work needed to follow those standards, those minimum standards, the Secretary of the Interior standards for rehabilitation. Um, and I think it ultimately made a building which is much more authentic historically, 
uh, and it maintains more of its original fabric than what you might otherwise see in a kind of run-of-the-mill rehabilitation. I'll get off the soapbox now. Um, moving on. So this is a couple of shots of the, this is the inside of the building and you can see there's the, uh, not a small hole in the floor and not a small hole in the side of the building with the window uh, out completely. The um, tarps for, for five or six years, a succession of tarps over the building was pretty much the only thing that was keeping it from falling down. Um, because, there, because we knew what needed to be done, but, but the funds weren't available to do it. And so, in a lot of cases, what else can you do besides keep the rain out, try to keep it from getting worse than it is already, and, and keep planning and keep, keep moving forward? Um, and so, the, the, uh, this is the, the floors had, when, when the sidewall rotated out, you can see that here is not straight up and down, it's leaning out at about 30 degrees. When that wall rotated out, all the floor joists fell out of their sockets and they ended up hitting, laying on the ground. Other parts of the building, the roof had been lost on other parts of the building. And you see that just the, the way that the, the, the fabric of the building was essentially being eaten away just by water getting in. Every time it would rain, that building would get wet, it would get saturated, and the wood would rot a little bit farther. Every year it was getting a little bit, a little bit worse. Um, so the tarps did their jobs but tarps are only good for about six months, and then you have to put another one on um, because they get shredded or they can't go through the winter very well. So there's, it's definitely a temporary solution, but often it's the only solution. Here's a case where the floor had completely collapsed into the dirt, and as you probably know, when you put wood in contact with dirt, it doesn't do a very good job of not rotting. Um, so a whole section of the floor had, had just bowed down into the, into the ground. Interestingly, the wall right here is floating six inches above the dirt. It didn't, the wall never, never hit the ground, but the floor did. Um, but somehow, because I think of the stiffness of all of us, of the wood inside and outside on the wall, it managed to hold itself up, kind of floating, half of the building floating above the dirt. Up under the building, very, very, very um, rudimentary construction. What's interesting is that in, in, uh, in going under the building, what we kind of came to the conclusion was that a lot of the foundation was not from this building originally. The, building, the, the foundation piers were actually taken from another building, brought up to the hill, put in place, and then they built the building on top of them. Uh, and some of the, the, the floor timbers that you see there are not, this is not their first use. This is their second use. They were used as studs in another building. They have plaster marks on them. They have nail marks from uses that don't correspond to the way they are on the floor now. So the bottom, the whole sort of foundation and, and floor structure of this building was actually borrowed from another building or was taken from another building. Um, and that sort of goes, it's a little bit of the story of, of, the, of the kind of, in some ways, hard scrabble way that, that the, building, the, the building was needed and the community figured out some way to make that building happen. Whether it was taking pieces of other buildings, whatever it happened to be, that's how it was done. The rest of the building is, is all from, this uh, is a 1945 building, by the way. So, uh, uh, so some of these timbers date back to earlier in the 20th century, and then a lot of them are from 1945 construction as well. But um, they, they, the, the foundation piers were just put on the dirt, no footings, nothing that would prevent them from shifting over time. So if you look at that line of piers, that runs down the middle of the building, you can see they all go in kind of every different direction. So part of what we did as a, as a kind of preservation team was to, was to uh, open up the building in a way that every one of those piers could be lifted up, have a concrete <coughs> footing put underneath it, and then have it put back down on top um, so that the building would stop moving. <laughs> because buildings moving is not a generally good thing to happen. These are the drawings just documenting the existing conditions of the, uh, of the building, and then the drawings showing the existing conditions of the outside of the building. It's a, it's a relatively small building. It's about 14 feet wide and 60 or so feet long. Uh, and then the drawings showing the, 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 the work to put it back together, again, including the foundation pier work <coughs> and so on. Whoops. And the, the after photos. This was really for the benefit of the middle school kids so that they could see what drawings are. But I think you guys probably know what drawings are. Um, during construction, 
you know, you, it, when, you do, when you do a project like this, there's a certain amount of disassembly that has to happen in order to get to the parts that need to be fixed because there were fundamental structural issues that had to be dealt with. So the contractor, Savannah Construction and Preservation, um, ended up stripping the whole lower section of the wall out, taking the siding off, setting it aside, preserving it, so that it could go back in to its original location. There was some loss in doing this. Anytime you take siding off, you lose some pieces. And there was some uh, condition issues as well. But you'll see you're looking at actually the back of the, of the interior wood tongue and groove planking uh, through the studs on the lower section of the wall. All the windows went, were taken out. About, I would guess, 50% of the glass panes in the windows were lost. They were out already. Um, the windows were in reasonably good condition, but half of the, there were probably six windows that were made up of uh, sashes that came from someplace else. They were mismatched. So they would, you would have, you know, one would stick four inches beyond the other one when they're in the closed position. The windows went away to be um, reconditioned. So these are the windows that went back in that you see today are actually the original windows back in. No window replacement, no wholesale replacement of materials. We sistered material, we added material, but we tried to keep everything there that was already there in, in place. Um, and that, so that's the middle of it. But the most important thing was getting a roof on this thing. Um, and you can see there it's in process, but keeping the water out is by far the most important thing you can do with a building that's in bad shape. That's looking after the floor was taken out in order to address the structural issues with the floor. You can see something's not quite right there. That whole left side is, this is where it's fallen down into the dirt and all of those joists have rotted away. So we have, we have these punky ends of, of joists left. And on the right hand side, that's where it had all just fallen out because the wall had rotated out. So the, the center beam was, was kind of the spine literally that was able to be maintained as the straight and level part of the building and, and everything else had to be uh, uh, sort of lifted back up through various means. More detail there. Lifting, lots of lifting in a very systematic way. I got the floor back in, put the windows back in, and there it is today. Um, so some of the interior photos, there's three, three rooms at this building. One is the first grade classroom, which is the, the double doors beyond that you see, that's the first grade classroom. And that's the only photographs of this building that exist that we know of are of that classroom. And there's two of them. It's actually the only real photos of the Fairview School as in, in, its, in its entirety other than the student photos that I've ever seen. But it's that room right there. In the middle, there was a lunch room for the campus. And there was a kitchen at the back. So if you look at this, you see the five windows. That's the those are the classroom windows. And they follow the kind of Rosenwald idea, which was typical in, in educational buildings of that era the sort of banking of five windows or six windows. Because as I've been told, Mary, you tell me if I'm lying here, uh, all students were right-handed. <laughs> so as a left-hander, I'll say, that's an interesting idea. All, all students were right-handed. So the classroom was always oriented, the chalkboard was always oriented so that a student writing with their right hand would have the light coming over their left shoulder. So it would not shade the hand as it was writing. So in that classroom, if you need light over, what's, what's unusual about this classroom is that, that in order for that to be true, the front of the classroom is technically the door wall where the two doors are. So it didn't quite work here. But in the Rosenwald, all of the Rosenwald schemes, that was the idea. The head of the classroom would allow the light to come over the left shoulder. So you have the five, the five, the giveaway there is that the five windows are that classroom. Then you have two pairs of two windows. Middle room with the door. Um, is, the, is the lunch room, and then there's a kitchen in the back with the other double doors. So the only five bank window in this um, building is the one in the, in the one classroom in that building. Um, so inside, there's the, the, we're in the lunch room. It was heated with, with a wood stove, with a stove on both sides of a chimney there. You can see the, the hole where the, where, the, where the stove used to go in. Um, this is the, this is an interesting, all this white stuff is all new wood because that's where that wall had come apart. That's where that wall had separated. So this, so you see this is all that original material that had just rotted off into nothingness. It's cut back and it's too thin in a, in a way that 
you can sort of very literally see what the, what the limited extent of what was replaced in this building in order to put it back together again. And that, so, and I love that idea that it's discernible, it's matched, but, but you can see that by and large what's there is actually what's always been there. And a building that looked like it was in pretty rotten shape to begin with, that it actually, that there's a lot more there that can be saved and reused than you would think. It's a really significant um, idea. The floors are back in, and uh, yeah, the floors are back in, and you can walk in it. It's got a or AC now. It's been modernized very slightly. But there it was in, uh, this is probably 2012, 2013, uh, tarps and boarded up and so on, and then it is the same view today. So I always enjoy going back and forth like this. <laughs> it should be on a fade, back in a loop, an endless loop. Um, but I'm pretty proud of what we were able to accomplish. It's, and it's not me, it's, th this is, uh, you know, I played one small part in, the, in, the, in, in this whole project. I was able to create the instructions that showed the contractor how to make this happen. But I spent Joyce's money, I didn't make any of that money. I didn't do any of that. Um, so it takes a, it takes a team, it really, it, to not to be trite, but it takes a village in order to put something like this back together again. Um, so, I think it's a pretty compelling project, and I hope that it, it provides a template for similar projects in Georgia um, that to, to show, you know, it, it, if you can put the, put the group together, that there's a lot that can be accomplished, mm -hmm. and that there's a real significance and an importance to why you would do something like this as well. So thank you. That's the end. All right, so I think for the sake of time, I'm gonna have Mr. Allen come up real quick. He has some things to say about uh, Rosemont schools in greater Athens area. And then we can move into a space where we have food that's arrived. And that'll also give you guys the opportunity if you have more questions um, for them about uh, the Cave Spring project, which I'm sure you do. You guys can um, talk about that more with them while eating some refreshments and um, getting something to drink. So. Upon finishing high school and attending the University of Georgia, Mr. Walton Allen Jr. began his broadcasting career as a radio announcer and a sportscaster. He also has experience in broadcast production, radio advertisement, and he served as a DJ and a musical program director. Um, Mr. Walter Allen Jr. created Zebra Magazine. It's a black lifestyle publication 26 years ago, and it remains one of the top selling magazines in the state. It covers 11 counties in Northeast Georgia with over 100 distribution points across the state. After taking interest in Rosenwald schools, Mr. Allen has conducted some research into those in the greater Athens area, and he has even published several articles about the schools, the teachers, and their students in Zebra Magazine, and that's some of which he's gonna be sharing with us today. Okay, this first one on the top left is Judia C. Harris. Started this school at the age of 19. And she is the wife of one of the principals at Athens High Industrial here in Athens, Georgia. And uh, this school was started after she finished college in 1902. And it was burned and rebuilt in 1926. And this is the building on the right hand side here. And it was built as a five teacher room. And we have Mr. Stroud here who owns the land there now. He owns this building. And when it was, it was noted that it was on five acres of land, but uh, Mr. Stroud said he bought the plot as a 20 acre. So it's, it's 20 acres now. 
when he purchased the land and the building is still there. Um, I'm going to give you some more information about Judia Harris. I have a, anybody want to see, I have pictures of her in the school. And the school um, is only a half mile. They named another school in the Clark County School District after Judia Harris. And it's a half a mile away from this building, which it was named after. Okay, this picture here was given to me by Cordelia Allen, and this is in front of the Judea Harris School. It is a late 20s photograph this picture here is miss roberta barnett and the judith harris school taught how to how to be landowners and her and her husband luke barnett who's not pictured in that picture they became one of the biggest landowners in Clark County, her and her husband. Uh, many property was owned by them on the Atlanta Highway here in Athens. Okay, this is a photograph of the Rosenwald Funding School in Oconee County, which is a suburb of athens Clark County. Um, it changed its name in 56 from Rosenwald to Ed Stroud School. And, uh, That's, that's the one, okay, here is it is. Yeah. yeah. This is the Rosenwall in Oconee County School. Well, it became actually Ed Stroud School in 1958. This is uh, pretty much a 1928 photo. It said on three acres of land, the total cost was $5,810. $810 from Negroes, $3,500 from the public funding, and about $1,500 uh, from the Rosenwald funding. And if we go back and look at that picture, I, I was, I was here, here, here we go, here. Even after two years after they changed the name to Ed Stroud School, they still wore the Rosenwald jerseys two years later. You can see the Rosenwald High School on it. <clears throat> This is the Rosenwald Funding School in Jackson County. You can see where there's total cost of $3,000. It's a two teacher type facility on 3.25 acres of land. Mm -hmm. And they have gone through great means here of preserving the history of the Ed Stroud School. Mm -hmm. After integration, the people in the community wanted to, to continue the Ed Stroud school name, Rosenwald Ed Stroud school name, but that was kind of denied. So in Oconee County now, uh, they have pretty much said that we're not going to have name a school after any living human being. So it's really named now after roads that it might be on. <laughs> so no school is named after an individual in Oconee County. This is one that we kind of re really, Kayla kind of discovered. This is one in Jackson County. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a two teacher type. Mm -hmm. And basically that's, yeah. <coughs> 
that's it. I would like for y'all to meet Mr. Stroud. Would you come up and say something? I think this is, I've been at him for about seven, eight years. I said, man, you're sitting on the boat lot. <laughs> and with the school, but Army, are you come on up and tell us a little bit what condition of the building was when you bought it, you purchased it? Because it has a big library. You know, this is one of the bigger Rosenwald schools. That, and when you go in and look, of course, it was a five teacher type. Take this microphone too. Okay. 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 You can take it too. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Good evening. I've owned the building since the uh, late sixties. Uh, the building was bought first by. Stan and Phil Durden. Stan Durden was a, uh, an attorney here, and his brother, of course, Phil, uh, was a property owner. And uh, Honest Golden, who was in Hawaii for 25 years, bought the building from uh, Stan and Phil. And uh, uh, Honest Golden also bought property on the Smoky Road. And he uh, was, as I said before, was in Hawaii for 25 years. And uh, being from Athens, he stayed in Hawaii after getting out of the Army. And when he came here, I was uh, the organist for Hills Chapel Church. And his cousin, John Taylor, brought him to Hills Chapel and he heard me playing the organ and he wanted to uh, have jazz at his club. <clears throat> and he hired me for the entertainment to play there nightly. And he brought his family over after about a year and they, being from Hawaii, could, never did like the climate <clears throat> here. So he sold the building to me and uh, moved back to Hawaii. Uh, I had uh, a civic organization there. We presently use the building for about 26 different organizations. The uh, motorcycle cl uh, club, Corvette club, the uh, NAACP and other civic organizations, and we provide uh, opportunities for them to have uh, various events at the club. Uh, the building is, uh, has been totally remodeled on the inside, and of course the outside still has its basic character. And uh, it's out on the Danielsville Road, uh, you can drive by and look at it and what have you. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone so much. That's the end of our program, but if you exit this room, go down to the end of the hallway. On the right-hand side, we have refreshments. Um, from Marty's at Middays. I think there's some little chicken sandwiches, um, other kind of hors d'oeuvre food, so please eat that. Um, I don't think any of us want to take home all of that food, so please take some of that. And I think um, you'll have an opportunity if you want to talk with Joyce uh, more about her program. Um, I think Mr. Allen has to run, though, um, but please linger. Um, I'm so happy for you guys to talk with each other. I see all kinds of connections forming here in the room. And also don't forget to then go across the hallway. Um, some of us staff members will be down there and help guide you if you need help, but take a look at the actual Horace Mann Bond photograph exhibit on display. Make sure you check that out as well. I also wanna make note that we have um, Patrick Allen from the UGA Press here. He's set up in the hallway with the Star Creek papers and you might remember Dr. Hofschwelli talking about that, but that is actually a book based um, largely from Horace Mann Bond's time in uh, 
Star Creek Parish, Louisiana, based on his experiences in the early uh, 1930s. So there's some of those books for sale if you're interested. So check that out. And also Joyce has brought um, the historic or the heritage cookbook that she also mentioned in her presentation. She also has some of those for sale also, if you'd like, in the hallway. So please linger with everybody, check out those books, grab some refreshments, and look at the photographs, okay? Thank you. Thank you.